Good morning, friends, and welcome to this service of worship on this first Sunday in Advent at St. Paul United Methodist Church, downtown Ocean Springs. Let us worship the Lord together in spirit and truth. We continue our call to worship with spoken words. The Lord God is our shepherd. We, we are, are the, the people, people of God's, God's pasture, pasture, the sheep of God's, God's hand. hand. God will seek the lost, feed the hungry, and strengthen the weak. But, but the, the proud, proud and power hungry, hungry will, will be, be fed, fed with, with justice. justice. The hymn is number 196, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come the long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from my fears and sins. Release us. Let us find our rest in. The affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed traditional version. Let us unite together in this historic confession. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
We come to that time when we prepare as our minds and our hearts to pray together as God's people. A brief word before we do that, we love to hear from you and want to hear from you, and please take advantage of the different ways you might uh, let us know what's happening in your life or the needs that you have. One is to use an online Connect card, uh, connect.stpaulos.org. Please know we have a prayer ministry, a prayer team that will lift up your concerns as well and see the contact information to contact them and let them know what's going on. Let us pray together. God of power and glory, we remember today your awesome deeds across the ages. The times you have saved us and brought us home when we were lonely, when we felt cast off. Yet we also remember times uh, when we, you, we were jubilant and in finding our homecoming in you. We, we are your people. You are our God. Look upon us with your shining face in this and all our times of need. We pray for those who look to you for healing and hope during this uh, Thanksgiving week and first Sunday in Advent. We remember those who are sick or, or who are recuperating from illness or injury. We do remember those who are lonely and uh, have trouble finding companionship because of the virus and for other reasons. We remember those for whom the holidays bring sorrow or pain, those whose deep sadness overshadows joy. And we pray that your face may shine upon them, O oh God. We pray for all your people in need of restoration, some in need of reconciling with relationships, some battling addiction and those in recovery, for our people who are estranged from those they love, for people lost in grief. Lord, in your mercy, be with them and help them. For people who are far from home, whether literally or spiritually, let your face shine upon them, O oh God. Renew our spirits. Uh, sometimes we feel in a world that's grown weary with waiting and hoping. Help us to know that you are with us and that you will come again. In the midst of all our living and our doing, grant us clarity and passion and true fellowship so that we are awake to your presence. All these prayers we make in the name of Christ our God, our Lord, as we also together pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is always a good and joyful thing always to offer ourselves and our gifts to God as an act of worship. And so we invite you to do that now, uh, that we may join in together in offering our first fruits to the Lord our God, giving thanks for all he has done for us. The tangible ways to do that are several. One is to give online, give.stpaulos.org, and, and you may follow the, that link or go to our website and find that link, and it's very easy to do. Uh, through the mail, P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs, St. Paul, UMC. And we continue, or continuing until, uh, let's say tomorrow, Monday, our Still All In For Christ campaign. And so if you still would give a pledge or let us know what you're thinking about that, that would be helpful as well. Uh, please do so, and you may do that online. And its pledge card is online, or we have many uh, physical ones. We may be glad to get you as well. Pledge.stpaulos.org. God bless you. Let us pray. Pray together. Faithful God, we thank, thank you, you that, that Christ, Christ is being, being revealed, revealed in, in every time, time and place and until, until he comes, comes again in the fullness of glory. Of glory. Strengthen, Strengthen our testimony and spiritual, and spiritual gifts. gifts. Increase generosity in us, us we pray. As, As we, we wait, wait for, for the, the day, day of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.
read in Isaiah 60, verses 2 and 3. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon us, and his glory will appear up over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We light the first advent candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. Come, Lord Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. The gospel lesson today is Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31, what is often called the parable of the judgment of the nations. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not, did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, our Father, we bow before your throne of grace. As we do, we, your children, humbly ask you, break anew for us the bread of life, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Part of the significance of Advent is that it is a point where the years overlap, and which is to say that the church, we the church, live between two Advents. As we say virtually every communion Sunday, Christ has come, Christ, Jesus Christ, will come. The preparation for the coming of Jesus at Christmas overlaps with the preparation of his coming again in glory. Both of these strands of expectation are what Advent is about. And uh, the church has, has traditionally reinforced these two Advents at the beginning, especially at the beginning of the Advent season, because Christ, we understand, has ascended, as we say in the Creed. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. He is king, not at some later date, but presently. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We do not know the day or the hour, but if it happens in the fashion Jesus told about in his stories about the kingdom of God, it can happen in a moment's time. You know, like when you're at home and you hear someone knocking at the door. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. It is a majestic picture of the triumphant Jesus reigning in glory as the king and judge at the end of time. And then the camera pulls back to capture the whole scene. We're shown all the, all the nations of the earth, row after row of humanity gathered before the throne of the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the term 
by which Jesus calls himself that he pulled from the Old Testament. Just as the shepherd in that time sometimes would divide the larger flock, separating the sheep from the goats, the less valuable goats, so the Son of Man divides the people into the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. The Son of Man pronounces judgment upon the sheep and the goats. For the sheep, the news is good. They're given a divine blessing, and they are revealed as the true heirs of God. Because they saw others in need, it's pretty straightforward. Because they see or saw others in need, and they provided for those needs, whether it was food or drink or hospitality or clothing or some other form of care. They provided them when they provided for these little ones for the Son of Man as well. And as for the goats, however, they, they are condemned because they supplied none of these things, none of these ministries, even though the Son of Man himself was the one who was hungry and thirsty and a stranger and naked and sick and in prison. Rachel Riemann writes in her marvelous book, My Grandfather's Blessings, about learning as a child the different levels of charity. She was talking to her grandfather, she's again a little girl, talking to her grandfather about this. Uh, the grandfather was explaining that at the lowest and most basic level of giving or, or being charitable, a man begrudgingly buys a coat for a, another shivering man who has asked him for help. The man gives it to him in the presence of witnesses so they see the good deed he's done, and he waits to be thanked. At the next level up, he does it without waiting to be asked for help. And at the next level up, he does it open-heartedly, not grudgingly, and so on until he reaches that top level of giving, the purest level in which the man open-heartedly gives his own coat away without knowing who will receive it, and the man who received it, received it does not know who gave it to him. So no showing off, no waiting to be thanked, etc. And after hearing all this, the young Rachel said to her grandfather, I will only do it the right way. Meaning, I, I'm sure, with an open heart, without a grudge, etc. We might say, in the sheep kind of way. Her grandfather's eyes twinkled and he asked, But here is the special sort of thing. Suppose we all gave as the first man did. Even though he cared about himself, he was self-interested, he wanted credit for what he gave. But still, if we all gave even that way, would there be more or less suffering in the world than there is now? Rachel was confused. You know, she's a little girl. She said, less suffering? Her grandfather replied, yes. Some things have enough goodness in them as they are, worth, and they are worth doing any way you can. Riemann goes on to write that, of course, we want to give in ways that do not diminish others. But she says to my grandfather, my wise grandfather, it was better to bless life badly than not at all. I believe the grandfather was right. If all there was to Jesus' parable here is that those who do good deeds are rewarded and those who do not are punished, uh, it's just an ordinary kind of morality tale, to be honest. And you can find that story, that kind of story, in all kinds of religions and cultures throughout the world. But this one takes a curious twist when it becomes apparent that the sheep have no idea whatsoever. The sheep, not just the goats, have no idea whatsoever that in their compassion toward people in need, they are providing for the ministry of the Son of Man. Again, we know who that is, Jesus. And likewise, the goats had no clue that in their indifference, they were in fact neglecting the Lord of all, the Lord of all the nations. Both groups are stunned and exclaim, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And then the surprising reply, whenever they acted, are failed to act compassion, compassionately to one of the least of these, these ones that a lot of people don't even see. They did it so to Jesus. 
And that is the dramatic disclosure, my friends. Jesus Christ is present in the world. Where? In the least, the least of these. That is the focal point of his message. The world will be judged according to whether it did or did not show hospitality to Jesus Christ. The Messiah clothed not in royal majesty, not here as we, as we behold him now, but coming to the world hidden among the least, hidden among the least of these. Now, I own up to this. People today are generally more, less, less oriented toward the farm and let's say more agriculturally challenged than in times gone by. You may think along those lines that sheep and goats are not all that different. Certainly they're, they are more similar than, say, you know, dolphins and chimpanzees. Uh, and they both, you know, say, bah. <laughs> so I think if two animals can speak the same language, maybe they've got something pretty similar to one another. But we often think of sheep in the image of Scripture as God's people. As the psalmist said, we are the sheep of his pasture. By contrast, goats are stubborn, they're headstrong, may not see things the same way as sheep do. Again, we're told that there will be a grand sorting out in the kingdom of Christ. And some, like sheep, will be gathered to Jesus' right hand, having succeeded in feeding the hungry and visiting the stranger, etc. But others, the goats, will be at the left hand for having failed to feed and clothe and visit and love. In the case of our story, there's, again, one very striking similarity then that they both ask Jesus the very same question, when? When? When do we see you, you hungry or thirsty or in prison or lonely or naked? When? When, Lord? Sheep and goats. And the question inevitably hangs in the air at this point. So what about us? Which are we? Which are you? Which are me? I mean, I'm on the right or I'm on the left? You know, we both may speak some of the similar language, but... Apparently, there's a lot of difference between those two areas. Well, let's find out. Uh, let's do this exercise. You just do it at home from where you're viewing and worshiping today. Raise your hand if you've ever given food to a hungry person or offered clothing to someone who's had a little or let, you know, provided for clothing, whether you knew them or not, or visited a stranger or someone who was sick or given water to someone who was thirsty. Raise your hand also, though, if you've ever failed to give food to a hungry person or failed to offer clothing to someone who had little or failed to visit someone who was lonely or a stranger or who was sick or not even thought to give water to someone who was thirsty. You see, this complicates things. This exercise Actually, the same exercise we just went through was done some years ago by a group of nuns. Now, if you know anything about nuns, you, you know that they can be some of the feistiest, servant-oriented people around. And they did, they did probably and answered similarly to we, as we did. We put our hands up for both, both things, both categories. We've both done them, and we both failed to do them. And so, realizing this, they sat for a while in quiet, reflecting on this paradox. And finally, one of the nuns, an ancient woman, stood up and said, you know, I know what this means. We're all good goats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, one of my favorite greetings sometimes on Sunday morning is to come and say, good morning, saints, to the congregation. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. And say, well, we're all here and not only are we all here, we're all both of those things, of course. Truth be told, truth be told, we're both sheep and goats, right? Yes, yes, we're both. But again, it seems that both the sheep and the goats suffer from the same lack of vision. They just don't see Jesus and the ones who are hurting, who are in need. And that's, that seems to be the deal breaker. That seems to be the difference. What we have here... Maybe to paraphrase that prison guard in the old movie, Cool Hand Luke, the old Paul Newman movie, 
is not, not a failure to communicate. It's a failure maybe to imaginate, if you will. Having been unable to see what God has placed before us, we now you know, can, we can act like we haven't seen it. Uh, we now cannot act on what we haven't seen. And the exercise of our imagination is vital. Our God-given imagination, holy imagination, is vital if we are to find Christ in others. It is also necessary if we are to reject or renounce what is perhaps the primary temptation of our lives. Moved uh, by this same final scene and feeling the burden of the question before us centuries ago, Christian leaders made a list of sins, what is often referred to as the seven deadly, the seven deadly sins, sins that were so scaly, so serpentine, that they, you know, if left unleashed, could destroy a person completely. And do you know, do you know what is at the top of that list? At that top, the top of the list of those seven deadly sins, they listed something called akadia. And that is a word that literally means, I don't care. I don't care. The goats are not condemned for doing bad things. Did you notice that? We often think of judgment about that way. Oh, I do all kinds of bad things in my life. God's going to get me. But this is Jesus' primary parable that's kind of summing up and synthesizing everything that he said before. They're condemned for doing nothing. They bore no malice uh, to these ones who were hungry and thirsty and alone and put away. They simply did not see any relationship between their lives and the lives of these other least. There is a relationship that is what Jesus is saying. That is both the good news and the bad news. For today and for that last day, when we all stand before Christ the King and find out who we really are. There is a relationship. And it's up to each one of us to decide what we will do or will not do about it. It's interesting that the very next thing that happens in this gospel, right after this parable which is the end of Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Matthew. The very next thing that happens is the plot to kill Jesus, and of course his crucifixion. And these events are put in motion even as, you know, Jesus' words hang in the air. And that really kind of informs everything as well. You know, it tells us that the one who will judge the sheep and the goats was himself judged and found guilty suffered the depths of human pain. He was arrested. He was thrown in prison. He was sick from being beaten. Nobody came to visit him. He was thirsty on the cross, and they didn't give him water. They gave him sour wine, but not water. He was naked, and they did not clothe him. In fact, they divided up his clothes to be kept for themselves. He was a stranger to them. He was an object. We, most of us, have at least an inkling of what that is like. But you might say he was a goat in this respect. Goats, as you and I are, how we know about ourselves as goats in terms of being rejected. He was condemned to death. He was cast aside. He was left to die and then he died, he died, and he descended to the dead. And so if there is any reason for any hope for us good goats, it's that the king is also the man who willingly became a goat himself for us, who knows what it's like to be condemned and cast off and sentenced to torment, but who overcame it. He rose above. He transcended it. He died, really died, and descended to the dead. But he was raised from the dead and ascended as king of all. What this says is, we goats need not fear death and darkness. Oh, we will to some extent in this life. But we need not because death and darkness are not the whole story. 
we do better simply to hold up the question, which is what this, this lesson is about today, the final question. The one essential question by which all, all are measured is really a surprising one. You may not think of it as a surprise, but in some respects, even though I've heard this story for years and years, I still do. I'm surprised by it because listening to people, you know, who otherwise you might think of as fairly deep people, maybe spiritual ones, one gets the impression that there is some other question that is really the main question. And so even we had in our churches and Christian groups, we might have this back and forth and dialogue questions about what is really the ultimate question and meaning in this life and in the world. And so the religious air is just filled with all these questions, and it can be anything, uh, anything under the sun. But it is very seldom that you hear that discussion that centers upon this question, uh, which is in the mind of God, the ultimate question. Sometimes we wish it were not, but it is. I do not wish to make light of the you know, the concerns people have, but I do believe I agree with the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham who said, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, it is God's job to judge, and it is my job to love. I do wish to underscore this one thing because the gospel demands we do it today, which lies also in the arena of common sense. And let's put it this way. If you knew you were going to face a final exam about one question, <laughs> and we are told that the one who's giving the exam, the examiner, uh, is going to let us know what that question is going to be, is it not reasonable that we might use this one question, hold this one question up, that it would gather to itself all our interest and all our energies and what concerns us the most this day and every day? What is the question? How did you respond to human need? That's it. That's the question. I was alone, and I had no one in the world. My husband died. My children lived in another state, but I stayed in that big empty house. Did you or did you not come? I was in prison, cut off from society for my misdeeds and my mistakes. A criminal, yes, but still a human being. Did you or did you not visit? I was hungry, peering into the world of banquets and diets. I saw more food flushed down disposals than an entire family had eaten. Did you offer me anything to eat? I was without clothing, looking into the shop windows, you know, gathering, uh, gazing at the wardrobes of the world, waiting for the styles to change, you know, hoping for an old coat or dress. Did you offer me anything to wear? I was a stranger, new at the job, new in town, new, in the, new on the street, new in the neighborhood. I did not know a soul. Did you introduce yourself to me? Because the fact is, when everything is over, and the streets have been rolled up, and when all the switches have been thrown, and when everything we have been doing has been done for the last time, the Creator and Judge of all will come, will call the world into account with this question, how did you respond? And so we begin our Advent journey. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our final hymn is a beautiful Advent hymn, All Earth is Waiting. Let us sing together. <clears throat> is waiting to see the promised one and the open furrows the sowing of the lord all the world bound and struggling seeks true liberty it cries out for justice and searches for the truth thus says the prophet Oh, 
virgin mother will bear Emmanuel, for his name is God with us, our brother shall be. With him hope will blossom once more within our hearts. Mountains and valleys Highways, new highways for the Lord. He is now coming closer. So come all and see and open the doorways as wide as wide can be. In lowly stable, the promised one appeared. Yet his presence throughout the earth today, for he lives in all Christians and is with us now. Again with his coming, he brings us liberty. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit abide with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm.